What's going on, guys? Hey, you know, it's a solid Tuesday. I had to double check that it was Tuesday, but yeah. it's solid. I don't Tuesday. even know what day it is anymore. I retired in August, and every day is Saturday except once a week it's Sunday. There you go. That's that's <laughs> great. Well, I don't know if I would go along with his description. He's calling no it's been a lot of Mondays. <laughs> well, I was on the phone with you this morning at about 9.30 a.m. And he and he heard this boom. He's like, hey, what was that? And I was like, oh, that was a crash. Don't worry about that. I'll call you back in a bit. <laughs> I should probably let you go. Yeah, exactly. Uh, um, I have a funny story about, about crashes. My wife and I were driving one day in San Antonio, and it was raining, and it was cold. And I'm trying to merge into traffic, right? And right as I merged, the guy in front of me stops. So I hit the brakes Well, it's wet and I just slide right into him and I hit him, but it didn't, I didn't hit him that hard, but I still hit him. And, uh, I mean, this is a big intersection. So he pulls over and I said, Hey, we're going to get hit here. Let's just keep on going, pull over. I'll follow you and we'll, we'll just settle this. So he did, but he had already been hit. Like his truck was already, had been rear-ended already. So he had a brand new tail light, which I broke. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we go and, you know, we pull over and, and we talking to him and I said, man, I'm sorry. And he's like, yeah, no big deal. I understand. I said, all right, you want to exchange, uh, you know, insurance or what do you want to do? And he's like, dude, and honestly, I, it just broke the tail light. If you just pay for my tail light, I'll be happy with that. And I'm like, holy crap. I said, how much? He goes, 50 bucks. I'm like, hell yeah. So, yeah, let's so get I, out of here. So I go in the truck and I tell my wife, you got cash on you? I said, I, said, I need 50 bucks. And she's like, sure. So she reaches in her purse and she gives me 320. She gives me 320. And she goes, ask him if he's got change. I'm like, hell no. He's getting the whole 60. We're getting out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so well you're so, you're talking about a car crash i was talking about a cnc machine crash oh wow that's i don't like those <laughs> <laughs> no me neither <laughs> neither one of them are good no yours no cost, yeah yours, no. yours cost less it's but oh my god i was laughing because i mean at the time it was like let's go let's go and i gave him 60 bucks and he was happy and we left and then after a while i started just laughing and my wife hates it when she when i tell this story but it's so funny because she's like well see if he's got changed i'm like no we're not gonna worry about 10 bucks we are getting off easy woman really easy here yeah <laughs> that's the yeah, truth yeah. the um uh, speaking of crashes, I, uh, well, we didn't crash, so no, knock on wood, but, uh, you know, I have an NTX machine, just big, massive thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, I was chambering barrels last week on my manual lathe and my machinist come in and he goes, uh, I said, man, I wish I could just do it on my CNC and just get it over with. Cause I got to do like three or four barrels. They're all for myself, but I just want them perfect. Right. And, mm -hmm. uh, and he's like, how would you do that? And I said, well, it's kind of a pain because I have a true bore. You know what a true bore alignment system is? So yeah, I, I have a couple of those. I said, you know, I said, he goes, would we have to remove the chuck and all that? I said, you know what? I said, I bet you we can make a back plate with a three inch stub out the back. And I said, all we have to do is take the whole true bore and put a three inch collet on the, on our, uh, I have Royal collets call it chucks mm -hmm. i said we just put a three inch collet on there put the whole thing on there and clamp it and it's good enough i mean it's not going anywhere i said and uh then we throw a barrel in there indicate it and rock and roll so they're like well yeah that would work so you know how things are we're, we're eating lunch and it's like you want me to call our metal supplier see if he has anything i'm like <sighs> Sure. I said, it's going to cost a million dollars to get a nine inch piece of freaking metal by like four inches. So he calls and he goes, you're not going to believe this. They have one. They have a drop on the floor. It's like 250 bucks. And I'm like, go get it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we machined a three inch piece of metal, just a stub. Right. And then we clamp it on there. And we did all the, the rest of the machining on the lathe. And uh, so then we throw the true bore on there. We throw a barrel on there. We indicate it. It's perfect. And it's like, how are we going to hold the reamer? And it's like, well, we can put it on the, on the milling head. We just get it, you know, I said, but it has to be perfect. I said, so call and get a shrink fit holder, but it gets it seven sixteenths. I said, I don't care. We'll shrink fit it every time. Like every reamer. I said, I, if I do this then I'll just get additional ones. 
the shrink fit holder <laughs> for 716s i did not realize 716s was an oddball size eleven hundred dollars for a capital c6 oh and whoa. i'm like yeah we're not doing that <laughs> <laughs> I said, we ain't doing that. So then we're sitting around going, how are we going to do this? And I said, well, all we have to do is throw a two inch collet on the sub spindle and I can just clamp onto my floating reamer holder and then just, and I said, yeah, but I don't want to, I don't want it to float. I want it to be rigid. I want it. I want to try And plus I want to spin it. And I don't know that floating would be good if I'm trying to spin it. So it has to be rigid. Wait a minute. You, you haven't talked about the spinning thing yet. Like you're talking about spinning the reamer and the barrel. Yeah. In opposite directions. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I don't think right. my yeah. fingers can. Yeah. Just like this. Sure we're Just like this, Francis. Yeah. Oh, that's hard. Yeah. To the do. other way. Yeah. It's hard. <laughs> no, to but do the that. other way. <laughs> I, yeah, so, I get it. Yeah. So, so we decide we're going to do this. And, but I'm going, how are we going to do this? Like, how am I going to hold the reamer? And then it dawned on me, I'm like, well, duh, I'll just throw it on the sub spindle. I'll just throw a, just a sacrificial piece of metal, inch 250, uh, you know, stick it out three inches, drill it, bore it 716s, and drill and tap. I mean, this, this is a, a mill turn machine. I can, I can do it all while it's in the chuck. And then when I'm done chambering barrels, I just throw it away. And next time I do it, I do another one, right? So we tried it and dead nuts. Like we put an indicator on there, a 50 millionth indicator. And it was just like, it had like one tenth of run out. And I'm like, this is so perfect, right? So, so we finally today we, we, but so my, between centers, my machine is like four and a half feet. So the reamer's way over there in the, in the barrels over here. And so you can imagine this massive sub spindle coming in with a tiny little reamer <laughs> on the end and it's spinning. <laughs> and uh, long story short, we chambered it and it was amazing. It was perfect. The threads, we did a Higby thread. Just, we just went all out. You know what a Higby thread is? You know what a Higby thread is? I do. Yeah. So we did. We, yes, I do. We, we milled it and it, it, we just went all out. It took us, the punchline is, it took us like four days to chamber this barrel. <laughs> <laughs> you could have had it done in an hour. <laughs> oh, yeah. But it was so much fun. And now that we did it, it's like, okay, now let's throw a real barrel in there and I'm going to throw my good reamer in there. And that one we got done in like 10 minutes. It was, you know, after it was all set up, it was so fast. But it was fun. It was a lot of fun. No crashes. Luckily, learning is half the process. That's the fun part. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. The guys and I had a lot of fun doing this this project because it all started with, it would be cool if, you know, and then mm -hmm. we did it. So, what a year, huh? It's been a yeah, good it year. Was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> So I got to know you guys. So at first I met Chad, right? Because he, uh, he won the, uh, the AG cup, the last one. Mm -hmm. And, um, it was about this time last year. Yeah. And, um, mm -hmm. people kept saying, you need to interview Chad. You need to talk to Chad. You need to. I said, okay. And I kind of had started doing the interviews and, um, so somebody, and I think I took a screenshot and I just sent it to you. I went on Messenger, and I had, and then that's when I found out you and I had actually messaged before. Um, mm -hmm. And I just sent you a screenshot, and I said, "We're gonna do this or what?" That was that was my way of asking him. <laughs> and he's like, "Hell yeah, let's do it!" And the rest is history, as they say. Well, and now we got a date next month. Yeah, exactly. It's gonna be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, it's. I don't know what we're gonna do, but I'm gonna I'm gonna bring extra ammo, and I want to see a chamber of barrel on that on that lathe. We'll throw it on there. We will throw it on there. You will. Right. You will. It's it's quite impressive uh, to see this thing. Uh, so does that mean that the next level is gonna be to dual chamber from two different ends, screw on two actions, and then fire bullets at each other and see which one has more barrel left on it? <laughs> Why not? I've actually it one step too far. No, it's not too far. <laughs> I've actually considered doing this and it's probably something I'm going to do because I have a lot of old barrels and uh, I have considered doing this like 
because they always tell you shoot that way from the barrels are always marked this is the back that's the front i'm like what happens if i reverse it same barrel yeah what happens we're gonna find out <laughs> you're, you're gonna find out i bet you nothing different will happen yeah and uh <laughs> we'll find and, out though and if something amazing happens I'll probably keep it under wraps until after the world championship. <laughs> well, I will say like even a, a bad result is still good information. So it'll tell you that, Hey, we've been doing it right all this time. Yeah, precisely. But yeah, I'm just curious about that, especially because we do inch two fifty barrels. I could just swap ends. No problem. Speaking of chambering, you, you know, you, you chamber barrels, you, you got a fancy, nice CNC machine now. How's Not that as going? fancy as yours. How's it's that going? going well. Yeah. Yeah, it's super Other than fun. This Do what? <laughs> no, every, every day's a learning opportunity. Yeah. So is that the one you crashed? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, what it happened? Wasn't like I, I crashed. No, it wasn't like I crashed the tool post into the, into the dang chuck. It was, it was just a simple, you know, I had a parting tool and my hand oh. slipped on the hand wheel. And it just it just went in a little faster than I wanted, so it wasn't a big deal. And out comes the yeah. just 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 a new insert type of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've done that. Uh, one, uh, I forgot to uh, to cancel out my my rapid, you know, and then I went to part. And my my DMG Mori has uh, the rapid. You can go all the way down to one percent for testing. So a lot of times when I'm testing a program, I have it like at 1% because if you go to zero, it stops. It, it's, it's like a feet stop. Mm -hmm. So I always keep my hand on the, on the knob. So I'm always running at 1%. So I went to go cut the part. Perfect. Seem a little slow, but I thought, well, whatever. Well, then when I went to go run it, you know, I, I increased my feet, my, uh, my uh, rapids. Well, it turns out I didn't have a G01. I didn't have a feed command. I, it was a rapid. So once I increased it, it went, whoosh, and I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah that's not good. <laughs> yeah, rapid on that machine is probably like 1,200 inches per minute or something crazy. It's very rapid. Yeah. It's it, it's rapid enough that it shakes the whole machine, and, and the, the machine is, uh, the big machine is 50,000 pounds. The small one is wow. 50. It's like sixteen thousand. Yeah, they're they're heavy, but they don't they're rapid enough that you know you can feel the floor shake. I can it's, move mine with a pallet jack. It's not even on the same spectrum as what you're talking about. It's it's crazy, but it's it's amazing. It's fun. Um. Oh, Francis, how you doing, buddy? He's here too. Let's 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 hear from Francis. <laughs> <laughs> that might be the longest silence that I've had in my life. <laughs> so who was the one soldering cables? Was that you, Francis? That was the, no, that was Chad. Chad. However, it, it was my idea. Yeah, that was, hey, things break. We got to fix them. We had some bad cables as we were trying to record on the way down uh, to the AD Cup. And it just started cutting out. And so finally, Chad's like, we can't record. And we go about 10 miles. And I'm like, there's got to be a hardware store that has a soldering iron. We're going to fix this. I've got a 110 volt output right here in the back of the truck. We're making this happen. He's like, no, it won't work. And I still immediately pull over. There's a store. It's a half a mile away. Sure enough, they have this little hand soldering iron. And Chad was like, this is in the photo that I put up on Facebook was like the first test where he was like, this isn't going to get hot enough. And then all of a sudden, oh, it works. And his <laughs> face was, it was just priceless. So, yeah, it was good. The funny they thing is, like, I, I, I know I, I build guitars. I have built like 30 or 40 uh, custom guitars, like from scratch. I wind the pickups and everything. And so I'm, I'm familiar with soldering like small stuff. And when I looked at inside these connections, I'm like, this, this is not going to work. This is not a good idea. But it was a, it was fun to try. And it worked for like five minutes. And then we got frustrated and went and got some chicken wings and gave up on it. So it was, there you go. But it was it was still a good idea. It just didn't work. Yeah, we had to find a music time, store. It works ten percent of the time. <laughs> the uh, so I mean, when did you guys start the podcast? Because you guys have been really, really sticking with that and doing well. Was it Francis April? I've got to remember. I think it was in April, Aprilish time frame. April May. 
Yeah, March September. was our first recording session. It was on the way to a War Rifles match. And we yeah. made a commitment to ourselves. Like, we, we want this to be educational and drama-free, but we also want it to be reliable. And we want people to count on the fact that every week they can get an episode. So, you know, Hell or High Water, we put out an episode 6 a.m. every Thursday morning. The only one we missed was uh, Thanksgiving, and that was on purpose. We basically yep. just said, hey, we're not going to put out an episode on Thanksgiving. But every Thursday morning, 6 a.m., or earlier, uh, an episode gets dropped every week. Sometimes two, if there's yeah. a double. That's what uh, I actually plan my my episodes around holidays because I know that's when people are sitting around with nothing to do. Yeah, and I just mm -hmm. always try to make sure that I have episodes out on holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's. Which you know, we, we spend a lot of time, you know, early on, especially when we talk part of the, the conversation ultimately goes, are we doing the right thing daily, weekly, and monthly to try to spend the right amount of time with the right amount of priorities and, you know, prioritization planning and preparation is a lot of what our podcast is about. Um, but when it comes to, you know, family, Chad's, you know, the discussion behind that, you know, there's an episode that talks about Chad's big steps forward with five by five and, you know, moving away from one career and into one where he can be more family present. So for us, you know, when we have big holidays or things that are really like, if there's a choice like that one was specifically like, Hey, this is the holiday where you should be doing anything, but listening to a new podcast today, just take this week, go spend it with your family, go shoot, go prep, go plan, go hunt, go fish, go read a book, like do something, but that's your podcast, right? It was just, you know, that's your, your task for today. So Chad's been um, a really good driving force, at least for me, in exactly that and changing priorities and making sure you just keep looking forward to have better priorities. Yeah, well, that's good. The uh, so you said you retired. Is is that was that a true statement? <laughs> like, did you change Hell careers? No. Did you no, change yeah, careers? Just, is that what you did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I owned a manufacturing company, and um, it was. It was fun. I mean, it was, I think it was what I was born to do, solve mechanical problems. Um, but as a business owner, like you have all kinds of things that you don't expect to have to deal with, uh, like HR issues and, and customers and, and all kinds of stuff that my mechanical engineering brain does not enjoy. And uh, I, I like working on machines. So after 10 years of owning that company, it was time for me to move on with everything that was happening in the world and raw material shortages and, and labor issues. There's just, it was just the right time for me. Um, so, I mean, I didn't get rich off of that. I just, you know, got my equity out of it. And now I walk to work from my house to my, my shop behind them. <laughs> kind of like you. Yeah. Yeah. Walk, walk to work. Um, I don't have any employees and I, I plan to keep it that way. Hopefully I want to just do what I can do. Be careful and with that. I, That's what I said. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't really know what the future holds. All I know is that um, I'm more comfortable saying no now, now than I ever was. <laughs> I, I know what my limits are and <laughs> having fun doing it. Yeah, I say I, respectfully no, though. Like I'm not. I'm not. I I grew up on a farm and um, fixing anything that broke. So I'm I'm comfortable fixing mechanical things. But uh, this I don't know how or when it happened, but instilled at a very young age was. You don't ever say no to anyone. You know, you find a way to get it done. And that's kind of my, it's my strength and my weakness all at the same time. It's like, uh, I'm not going to say I get taken advantage of, but I like to help people. I like to figure things out. And if somebody really needs my help, I'm not going to say no. It, it's just the way I am. Yeah. I, I man, I, I completely 100% identify with you. But, you know, one thing that I realized, like I, and this might help you as well. Uh, you, you, you always trying to help somebody or everybody. And that's, that's me. But then you have to be selective because you only have so much time. And then what, what ends up happening is you're helping somebody that in reality doesn't need the help. And because you're busy helping that person, you can't help the people that really need your help. Right. Yeah. So then I kind of made myself more available so that when that uh, when that happens that somebody actually really needs my help then i can help those people so that's kind of how i had to step back and look at it because uh, dude I'm, I'm i know exactly 
exactly what you're talking about. I mean, I did the same thing. I was, I was a builder. I had a pretty massive company and I was like, man, this is not, you know, I, I just was never home, never spending time with my kids, with my family. And I thought this is not, this is not the way to do it. So I didn't, I, I just said no more and that's it. And I'm, I, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying life now more than ever. And you should be, I mean, you work hard enough every day to find things that, you know, just keep you going as opposed to loving what you do to where it doesn't feel like you work anymore. And that is, that's one of those statements you hear as a teenager or going through high school, maybe even into college, like love what you do and you'll never work another day in your life. And that statement, I didn't think that that was really true un until I actually found it. Now I'm like, yeah, it, it is amazing when you really separate yourself from your work and your work is your passion and it's, but it's a fun passion that you're not working anymore. You're just learning. You're having fun. I, man, you, it's hard to put that into context for people who haven't gotten there yet. Yeah. It's amazing. It's an amazing feeling. Like I get up every morning excited. Like I told you, it took us four days to chamber barrel. Uh, it would have been done in an hour or two, you know, in my manual lathe, but we just wanted to experiment and uh, we have a new, uh, a new guy who we're, we're trying to turn into a machinist and he's really smart and he was really excited about this whole process of, of us taking, doing something that really doesn't make sense at first, but now that it's done, it's like, that is so cool, you know? And yeah. it was a lot of, it, it was a learning experience, like, um, for all of us, even, even my machinist, who's the most experienced here, uh, my, I always say I'm not a machinist. I just somebody who owns machines, <laughs> but, uh, it's, it's, it was a lot of fun, but yeah, love it. Yeah. It's crazy. What, I mean, in the machining world, looking at the performance of our rifle systems, how much machining tolerances and call it the levels of innovation that have to occur for us to do what we do every single day. Uh, it, it, it almost is mind blowing when you think about it and you go in steps of decades of what bullet performance has had to come to barrel performance, action performance, um, reloading components, availability and component selection. I, I mean, just today I was shooting some groups and just doing some quick videos and doing some things at work. And as I'm shooting, I realized I just fired a five shot group in 12 seconds that measures 0 0.2, just, just trying to fire some stuff just to get some slow motion video. And mm -hmm. I'm like, how is that possible? Like that shouldn't happen. Uh, just another day, just another day. Right. Well, it's, it's funny because the three of us have all said many times now that it's so simple. You just grab a yellow box and you open it up <laughs> and you put that bullet yeah. on top of something that came out of a blue box and it works. That is absolutely true. But the decades of, you know, iterative innovation and small improvements have gotten us to this point. And, I don't, I can't explain it. Like, I just, I'm just thankful I mean, <laughs> that it's, that it's uh, at our fingertips. Yeah. There's what's, what um, your, your background is blurry, but I see a lot of blue with it back there in the back. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. My wall is like filled with, it's lined with like boxes back here. Of, and then behind me, I got some powder. I don't want, I don't want anybody knowing like what I got going on back here. I'm kind of blurring it out a little bit. So there, but, uh, <laughs> Yeah, you know, I mean, we always say the three B's, right? Brass, barrels, and bullets. If you if yeah. you got those three handled, your rifle's gonna shoot pretty well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you know, you talk about the advancements in bullets, brass, barrels, all that stuff, optics, actions, but also the shooters. I mean, yeah. they are more 100%. informed now than ever before. Yeah, I totally yeah. agree with that. You know, we meet a lot of shooters daily at matches and, and PRS is a really good example. Um, as we, when we started, the level of competition was pretty strong, right? At least it felt that way. Fast forward a year, it's even stronger. Another year, it's even stronger yet. And now you go to the point where something has never been done. We talked about this in our uh, first Believe the Bullet way back in the beginning of the year. Um at the AG Cup this year, Ben Gossett, who is this year's uh, AG Cup champion, cleaned the last day of the AG Cup championship. 102 shots. 102 yep. shots, perfectly clean. And our average target size was around 1.1 to 1.2 MOA, shot positional with an average range of somewhere in the vicinity of 500-ish yards. I mean, that is... <laughs> 
that is incredibly small at the pace at which we're shooting. And these positions were 90 not, seconds, 90 seconds, 10 shots, three, three to five distances on average with 1.2 MOA targets and winds that were up to about a 0.3 to a 0.4. I mean, which doesn't sound like much because it is low wind, but when it goes from zero to a 0.4 on a 0.3 target, yeah, and you're staying with it off of tires and flexible car hoods and rocks and props and tires that are balanced on top of one another. Oh my gosh. I mean, it, it is literally mind numbing to think about what it took for him to stay consistent for 102 shots. That's something Chad and I have tried to do at our local matches uh, frequently. And we've both come really close one or two shots off of a clean match. This is an order of magnitude more difficult than that what he accomplished. Um, not, not only that, he had the pressure of being at the AG cup. hundred percent. You don't have just yeah. everybody that you, you know, that just getting started in this sport, chasing you, you've got 40 of the best in the world. In this case, the, the top 15, 17 chasing you. That's an unimaginable feat. And like, you know, we talked about in F class that 200 with 20 X was the Holy grail, right? Shooting up a, a clean match and it was never done. And then all of a sudden it happens and then it becomes more and more frequent as you see that it's possible. And yeah. I think that's what you're speaking to when you say shooters are getting better. You know, half the battle is being open to the fact that it is possible. And from there, now all of a sudden you find ways to ensure that it's more possible more often. And then it becomes the norm. And I don't know that this will ever be the norm because there's a lot of variables that go into it, but it certainly does show that the best shooters in the world are getting better. And the average shooters are definitely getting better as not only as a result of their gear, but the knowledge that they have access to. I mean, it's, I, I wish I could start over four years ago and have access to, you know, our podcast or your, your podcast and your video series and the books that we have available. There's just so many ways to get smarter, faster these days. Absolutely. I mean, everything's there. If you want it, you can get it. You know, yep. uh, I call it software, right? The software, there's so much software nowadays and the yep. hardware is better than ever. So mm -hmm. the, the big thing about the hardware is when it shoots as good as it does now, as, as consistent as it is now, your feedback is much better, which yes. helps you learn much faster. Mm -hmm. So. I completely agree with that. Yeah. And Chad and I both have discussed that in the past. Like we'll parallel process things. Hey, you test this. I'm going to test a variant of this. And it's funny how we can end up at the same conclusions or he'll test a null. I'll test the, the uh, positive hypothesis. And we find, you know, the same point through different means. We go, yeah, that works. And we can tell how much it works or how much it doesn't work um, because we'll test things kind of back to back in different ways. And you're hundred percent right by being able to separate signal from noise, it tells you a lot about your skill as a shooter. And that's something that early on, I felt like I struggled with because my skills weren't as good as the equipment was capable of. And I didn't recognize that. And it's not until you cross that threshold of being able to outshoot a rifle or think you're outshooting a rifle that you realize, oh, there is something else. And then, it, then you think it's gear, and then you go back to you, then back to gear, and then back to you. And ultimately it's on you. Yeah. <laughs> Ultimately it is up to you. Um, which is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, uh, they, they, they often times say that F class is an arms race, but every sport is like that. Yeah. I think, um, the, the ability to have better gear is not, it's not a guaranteed way to win. It's not a guaranteed way to end up where you think you're going to be. Um, but it does help you when you know, when you have quantifiably figured out that something isn't helping you as much as it could by just testing and you find an average of one or two tenths, you know, over the course of a match, or in our case, you know, tenths of points, not dropping a shot here due to a better tripod or, you know, having a more consistent bipod that's easier to use under multiple circumstances. You know, you might find that it's only two or three points, but those stack over the course of a season or the over the course of a career to make you a better shooter faster. I mean, it's so crazy how we say every point matters, but it's it, it was never more apparent than it was this year. Going into the finale, I think there was five or six guys tied for a perfect score, which was 300 points, which means they each won three matches. And then the golden bullet was decided by a tiebreaker on the skill stage um, that 
it just blows my mind that that two guys tied almost, you know, they only dropped, I don't know how many shots in the whole weekend, 12 shots or, you know, 10 shots or something many. ridiculous. But they had, you know, a perfect score going into it. They tied and the, the whole match was decided on the fact that one guy dropped one shot on the skill stage. It's crazy. That's one shot I'll want back. <laughs> was that you? That's a, no, no. Oh, he'll it's, want a two, it it's a two and it's a two and a half minute target at 400 yards. That's one target you're going to want back. Yeah, for sure. The, uh, you know, I did an interview with Bart Souter and, and I, I keep quoting him or, or referencing that interview because it, it literally blew me away. He shot 30 targets, 15 at 100 yards and 15 at 200 yards. Okay. Of those 15, five were sh sh shot with or of those 15 there was three different guns and he shot five with each gun or something along those lines right so 30 targets 100 200 three different guns over a week his average group size was quarter moa okay <laughs> second place was 0 0.2502 Two ten thousandths of an inch. <laughs> How do you even measure that? But they, they, I think, I think they measure thousands, and then when they average it out, they, you know, it breaks down into ten thousands. I think that's how it's done. But the the thing that blew me away was he said that he his gun wasn't shooting very good, so. It, he found out he wasn't cleaning it enough. He wasn't getting it clean enough. And you know, these guys clean every 10, 15 shots. And so he, they're scrubbing the crap out of it and they're getting it like really clean. But anyway, I asked him, I said, what do you mean it wasn't shooting like it should? And he says, well, it was shooting about 180s to flat twos where it should have been shooting like 130s to 150s. Think about that. I just, just, just I slow can't down even and shoot that good. I said, just yeah. think about that. And I told him, I said, I said, Bart, that is impressive. It's so amazing to hear somebody say that because if I'm consistently shooting 180,000 groups, I'm just, I'm just so happy. <laughs> and he's, and he says, well, we have to fight for every one thousandth of an inch. That's, that's how tight the competition is. It's so tight that if he shoots a 180, he's like, oh, that should have been a 150. That's 30 thousandths of an inch. It's so amazing. What's yeah. it? I think that's just over a bullet jacket thickness. It's just crazy. Just crazy. Yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't even just imagine. Uh, it's it's such a such a competitive field you know and those yeah. guys are you know um obviously their sport that's what their sport is but it's amazing that they that they can shoot that good consistently yeah it's definitely an interesting sport like i'd love to figure out or get behind a ventress gun just just to see the, the mechanics Here's a good example of that i shot brian's f-class gun the carbon, you remember when they made those carbon, it was a, mm -hmm. uh, the carbon Pierce. Was, it was it Pierce? Pierce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The Pierce with the hydraulic -y recoil pads. Um, <laughs> I tried piece. shooting. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I was trying to shoot it and I, he's like, yeah, just go shoot it for a couple groups. And so I, I tried and I'm, I was shooting like three quarter minute groups and he's like, yeah, that's probably not what it should be. I'll, I'll be over in a couple hours to shoot it. And then he shoots like half minute groups consistently or better and i'm just going you know this is just shooting a rifle and then i grab my rifle put it down shot prone on my gear immediately shot point twos to point threes and went i i don't know what the difference like this should shoot better and i am physically not capable of shooting that well but it's i think i'd like to try a bench rest gun just just to see where the technique and where the equipment meet because but then again i know it'll be five years ten years before i'll get to where like somebody like a bart would be but it just goes to show to the same point. You can take the best year. The learning curve is still behind the shooter. Um, as much as we we want to say that we can always buy better gear, but it does come down where they're at. I mean, 
the best bullets. They have to be flawless. They have to be loaded flawlessly. The barrel maintenance is is obviously you know a consideration for how they're shooting because you I can't even fathom saying oh that one's out because it's thirty thousandths of an inch. It was on me, right? Uh, it doesn't. That blows my mind. The, the, well, it's uh, funny, like you said about the maintenance and cleaning and stuff, and and you even brought it up, Eric. Uh, have you noticed a trend of people talking to you about cleaning lately after our recent discussions? I mean, you've always preached cleaning, but holy crap, like Francis and I get messages daily about it now. Like there is the scales are tipping in the PRS. I can tell because yeah. of the stuff, the discussions we've been having. It's pretty, it's pretty intense. I've had people message me uh, at least a couple per week saying I have never shot so good. You know, my barrel has got 1200 rounds on. It's never shot so good. Well, they probably just weren't, you know, getting it clean. People say they clean, but after we talk and, and get down to it, it's just, um, their technique is not acceptable or they think they're cleaning and they're not actually cleaning it out. So, um, I, I know you've always talked about that, Eric, and you ha- in your circles, probably you guys have it squared away, but I've noticed since our discussions, like there is something happening in the PRS. And that's, that's what I'm talking about, about information, right? It, it, it's, uh, you know, like I've been preaching clean your barrels forever, but it's just based on my experience and what I've seen. What, what, what really sold me on that was one day we stayed at a house together, a friend of mine, Steve and I, and we're cleaning barrels. And I mean, I'm using IOSO and I'm just going to town and my gun is smooth because when you start, it's rough, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then by the time I'm done, it's just so smooth. And that's how I, I knew I was done. So then I'm, I'm done cleaning my rifle and I'm watching TV and we're drinking beer, talking, whatever, while he's cleaning his rifle. And I see his hand just chatter as he's pushing, pushing the rod, you know? We call it the gravel road feel. It just feels like you're going down a gravel road. And I said, uh, and he's like, he pushes that patch through and he's like, all right, I'm done. I'm like, you are not done. That barrel is dirty. He's like, no, no, look, the patch is clean or, or something along those lines. Yeah. And I said, no, let me, let me help you with that. And I think I went over there and I, I, I put abrasives through his barrel and I cleaned that thing just <laughs> clean to where it's smooth and man all of a sudden his barrel started shooting better again like the next day his scores immediately went up but again it was something that i believed but seeing it in somebody else's rifle where he was struggling to keep this thing in tune and all of a sudden the next day it's just right back it was eye-opening for me to say okay i'm on the right track and obviously i've tested it and it's just they just shoot better uh Mm -hmm. francis you you called me one day and you were you were asking me about this about uh abrasives what what did you find yeah Yeah, abrasives um when you shoot dirty barrels like at least from all the testing that i've done so far when you run a clean barrel to a dirty like a very dirty barrel you're going to see your sds grow your group sizes will also tend to grow it's not necessarily something you'll notice like on the order of like multiple tens, you won't go from like quarter to one MOA groups necessarily. I, I can also vouch that I've had a barrel that did do that, but normally you just see this sort of slight opening in groups that goes, you know, 20 to 50% increase in group sizes as you go through something like 100, 200, 300 shots on a PRS rifle. Um, but as soon as you put abrasives through it, you're going to drop your speed back, you know, 10 to 15, even 20 feet a second but it will, the SDs come right back. Your groups come right down to 0.2, 0.3, or the average of whatever it had been shooting. Um, And it's more consistent. I mean, I I can't really say it any better than the more I've used abrasives, even if it's just moderately, specifically with PRS, um, the more consistent that barrel runs over time. And the fewer times I use abrasives, or if I just use chemicals, I either have to work a lot harder, or I have to just be really diligent to keep it very clean immediately post shooting. So, and Chad, you know, Chad shoots, uh, does not use abrasives, but he does clean almost immediately after every day of a mesh. So his rifle is effectively not, you know, it's not hard carbon at that point. It has been fired a hundred times, but it's not hard. Like it's been sitting overnight 
or a couple of weeks until after the match. And then he'll sit there and he'll take the time after, a, you know, two weeks after a match to clean it out right before he shoots it again, but cleaning it out the right way. Um, I use nylon brush or excuse me, brass brushes and phosphor bronze frequently. So does Chad, because there's times where I cannot get the following out that accumulates from 100 to 200 rounds of firing. You just can't get it out with a nylon brush unless you're using some sort of mild abrasive. I also, or JB, or I like Bortec as well. Uh, Bortec makes the chameleon gel. And I found that's a pretty good intermediate. If you don't want to strip it bare and you really think it's not, it's too aggressive, that's a really good mild alternative that will at least show you some of the advantages. And then you can just keep working your way down to something more aggressive and you'll get there eventually. So we... I guess the benefit that, that that I have is that I'm not afraid to ruin a barrel in the in <laughs> in search for knowledge. Oh, you know? I should all attest that I'm not either. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so so we ran out of, up a few. We ran out. We ran out of Ayoso, right? And because we used the, we used the crap out of it. And last week, I'm like, I'm cleaning a barrel, and and I'm like where's the io so i asked jason and he's like i think we're out so we started looking i mean we're going through drawers and everything it's like dang it we're out so oh look here's some flits it's an abrasive it's you know yeah. it's a it is I, I bet you it'll work this is and we just went at it with flits and you know obviously we don't know what it's going to do long term but it cleaned it <laughs> it cleaned the barrel real good yeah it's, you know, it's really interesting because there's, I still think there's a whole new layer of learning that has to be done around, you know, the inside of the bore and how that affects either long-term, you know, fouling accumulation, the consistency of BCs, consistency of precision, like all of those things, the bullet has to pass all of those features in order to get to where it's going. So at some point, there's a detrimental effect that's going to happen if it's too dirty. Um, because it's going to abrade the jacket or cause more fouling, which changes dimensions in your bore, which changes bullet dimensions exiting, or it gets tight in one spot and loose in another, which is also theoretically bad. But I think fairly soon we'll see some quantified data that will actually show like, hey, you can see, you know, this is the trend as your bore changes in these spots, like your groups get bigger. If your bore changes in this spot, they don't get any bigger. They just shoot well. Or barrel roughness. I mean, there's a there's a lot of cool stuff I'm sure we'll see over the next year or two that uh, as companies start pushing more and more into it. So it'll be neat. Yeah. I feel like we just got a preview into what's coming. <laughs> yeah. No, it's just something we're working on. I'm, I'm personally just scrubbing barrels. Uh, there was one barrel that I, oh man, I don't, I think I not, shouldn't tell this story, but in March after war, I had a barrel gain almost 200 feet a second from call it new, which is, unfathomably fast from what I expected. It started a little at 2750. I thought it was settled at about 2850. Got to the end of that day one. I'm like, I am way fast. I am like mills over the target, like not quite mills, but tens of mills, three, four, five tens over top. I'm like, the only way this is possible is my zero has shifted and my speed is up because it happened at all distances. And sure enough, I chronoed and I was at, I started at 2850 in the match. I threw the match at 2880. By the end of day one, I was 2980. A hundred feet a second from just 80, a hundred rounds. And I'm like, this is wrong. I didn't know what to do. I scrubbed the crap out of it that evening and it stayed that fast. There was nothing I could do, but it was also causing some issues with groups and SDs. And I'm like, this is not good. I took that barrel. Oh, I have never scrubbed a barrel so much to see if I could get it back. And then I put some things in the barrel that probably shouldn't have been just to see if I could make the bore in the throat smooth enough to relieve pressure to make it shoot slow again. <laughs> Sounds dirty. I did. <laughs> I definitely did. I've actually used valve flapping compound before. I may have Th tried. That's to. what it is. Yeah. Um, Cause I was, I was like this. So I had a barrel that I, I shot the, uh, I don't want to hear this. Yeah, yeah. Cover your ears. You, you're gonna <laughs> definitely want to cover your ears for this one. So I shot the uh, the Silent Night match in Oklahoma, all right? Oh yeah. And that was when I was, you know, hanging out with with PRS guys, and and I'm, you know, we we rode up there together, and I'm like, uh, I'm not gonna be that guy that brings his cleaning gear, cause you know, like when in Rome, right? 
just act like the Romans. So I'm not going to bring my stuff. Well, it was a suppress match and I had never shot my rifle suppressed. So I just put a suppressor on there, shot it, tuned it with a tuner. Cause you know, suppressor does funny, you know, it just acts different. So I just tuned it with a tuner, <laughs> got it shooting good and cleaned it and went to the match. And after the first day, I think I was top 10. I was, I was not shooting bad. I was shooting pretty good. And it was just, oh, it was eating me alive that my barrel was dirty, but I'm like, it'll be fine. These guys don't worry about it. I'm not going to worry about it. The next night I start blowing primers about halfway through the match. It was just the pressure had built so much. The carbon had built up so much. So we get back from the match and, uh, of course I'm upset because now my scores just went to heck because I can't even cycle the bolt. I mean, I'm, I'm just struggling and uh, I get back home and that carbon had, it was baked on there hard. And, you know, I was so mad at that barrel. <laughs> I was, I was mad at myself, but you know, I took it out on the barrel and um, that's the one that I took lapping compound to because I was so mad. I just like, I'm going to get this carbon out of here ASAP. And I did, I don't know. I don't remember if it hurt the barrel. I doubt that it did, but it, I was just, it was one of those barrels that I, I felt like I had ruined by not cleaning, you know? And yeah. it, it's like, whatever happens after it doesn't really matter. It, it's, it's in my head, it was already ruined and I chambered a new one and on yeah. the, down the road I went. Is there something to be said for when you have a barrel that doesn't meet your expectations at a match and you know, it is not you any longer. There's something else going on. It doesn't matter to me. It doesn't matter how much I try to solve that barrel. It is just good for science at that point, because you're never going to have confidence in that barrel performing through the, when the match matters, it's never going to go to an important match. It's really only going to see practice and you're just going to use rounds to test, to see what happens. If, if it does happen again, can you eliminate that problem in the future? And that's really the purpose of anything that goes wrong. That's kind of my approach to. I mean, I struggle with trying to, even figure out how I can benefit from figuring that out. Um, sometimes it's, it's worth it just to use that barrel as a scapegoat and say that barrel was the problem. I'm going to saw it in half with my bandsaw and then I'm going to forget about it. <laughs> That's a good plan. Because, because then you don't have to think, well, what if like next time I'll just, I'll just blame it on that one barrel that one time. And it's dead to me. Like it's gone. So, so, you know, I told you we chamber that barrel and it was, I told you it was a bad barrel and a bad reamer. They're not bad. The reamer is just a reamer that I used to use that I no longer use. And the barrel is a barrel that I chambered that didn't really meet my expectations. Right. So my gunsmith, after we pull it out of the lathe and it's like the chamber's perfect and everything's just perfect. He said, uh, uh, what are you gonna do with this barrel? I'm like, oh, that's not a good barrel. And he went in there with the barrel. He goes, man, this still looks brand new. And I'm like, yeah, it's not a good one. He goes, what do you mean it's not a good one? I said, it didn't shoot. He goes, well, what if he shoots now? I said, it's not going to shoot. Just put it away. Put it on that junk pile over there. Just get it out, get it away from me. He goes, well, what if it shoots? I said, precisely. That is the problem. What if it shoots? Then I'm going to have to go back to all the other that barrels would be terrible. That, that, would I, be the that I said they don't work. And I'm just going to have to, this, this is going to drive me crazy. I don't have the kind of time right now. Just throw it in that pile where you got it from. And let's just forget about that barrel. It was just a practice barrel. And he laughed and, I'm talking about. and he walked yep. away and, and back in the pile it went. But that's precisely... <laughs> I completely understand what you're talking about. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. you just want to say, I'm right. I'm a great shooter. It was the barrel's fault. Let's move yeah. on with it. <laughs> yeah. And that's, yeah. I'm sure that's the outcome sometimes. And it's true. I just have that nagging feeling. What if I did this? What if it was something that I did? And that's where, you know, Chad and I are kind of fortunate that way. He's so unwilling to change methods and processes that I can change something. And if something drastic happens, it was probably me because we've done a good job at then coming back and not having the same issues. So I'm the experiment. I'm the variable that gets, uh, you know, tossed around. We always change one and he's the control. So, well, you know what I always say, you don't know. Well, it depends. You say a lot of things. Well, you say very few things frequently, but, um, <laughs> I'll let you do the hard work. Yeah. I'll let you do the hard well, work. That so one, I don't yeah. have to. Yeah. I'm yeah. That's a good one. 
the uh, you know the the kind of like the new hot cartridge on uh, you know in F class is that six point five PRC necked up to seven millimeter. Seven and PRC. Yep. Well, we can't call it that because now. Oh, that's true. Now there is a seven PRC. Th- now there's a seven PRC. I call it the PRCW because Alex Wheeler is the one that made this reamer for me, uh, or designed the reamer for me. But we've had this reamer for a couple of years, maybe three years, and uh, people are saying nowadays, uh, you know, now that people are having really good success with this cartridge, they said, uh, if you had the reamer, why didn't you ever chamber one? I said, because nobody was getting, nobody was beating me with one. So I just didn't worry about it. I said, now I got beat by one, two or three. I don't know. It's, it's, I'm starting to lose count. I'm like, okay, it's time that I chamber one, start playing with it and start figuring it out because there's something there, right? It's, I'm not going to go waste my time on, I I just hate chasing the, the best new thing because they don't all work out. And I just feel like that distraction hurts my performance more than it helps. Yep. Yeah, I I definitely know that. Go ahead, Chad. (laughs) No, I was just going to say, in your world, Eric, it's a little more finite. Like, it's a little easier to draw conclusions on um, bullets, powders, calibers, or whatever, uh, over time, having a specific advantage. But, you know, come over to the PRS world, and people are winning with, five to eight different Everything. calibers. And, and it's, I think it's less critical in our sport. Um, mm-hmm. The caliber specifically the caliber um, we'll say, but I think it's even less critical on the bullet and other, other aspects on the brass. I mean, people are winning with all these different variables. So I feel like if there was a new caliber to come out, I would definitely not change a damn thing because it's just impossible to say that the caliber even after years and years of use has any bearing on the person's performance. And, and I don't know, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like in your sport, it's a little different story because there is less variables. Well, it is different because uh, we are shooting at a one MOI target always, right? And it's different in a sense that everybody's shooting at the same target, it's known distance, prone with the front rest, like with the best equipment possible, right? So it comes down to the shooter having a really good rifle and the shooter being able to read the wind, right? And this is where I always talk about feedback because if that rifle shooting big, you don't have good feedback. You're gonna go chase, uh, you know, imagine, imagine it's a one MOE target and you have a one MOE gun. You can't miss the wind at all. Like even a, a, a tenth of a mile an hour throws you outside that that one MOE ring. You have zero real estate uh-huh. to be wrong, right? Now, if you're shooting a half a MOE gun, well, you have a quarter MOE on each side that, you know, that's about a one mile an hour wind that you could miss and still catch it, right? Yeah. And uh, where, the, where the bigger guns help, obviously, is instead of giving you a quarter MOA on each side, or, you know, instead of giving you one mile an hour, now you can miss by one and a half miles an hour yeah. on your wind call, right? And that's kind of where, where, where they are beneficial. However, you get too big, like a 300 WSM, it's a very good cartridge, but not, mo- not many people can shoot it well because yeah. it, it's a lot of recoil, the bags, it, there's a lot of torque, and you don't, you can't shoot it as fast as you can shoot like a 284, which means that if the conditions are mild, the guy shooting a 284, they're just gonna run through that, shoot a, you know, three, four minutes, five minutes, they're done with their 20 shots. And now you're over here shooting at 300, you're still stuck on shot eight or nine, and now the wind changes on you. Now you're gonna need that 300 because now you have to shoot through, through wind switches where the guy with a 284, when the when the wind died down, he got all his shots off. He's sitting there on a perfect score, and you know. So there's there's ups and downs about you know cartridges, but the magnums are if you can get the speed and you can shoot small groups, that's obviously the best case scenario. Mm-hmm. But 
if you're gonna if you're gonna increase uh you know get a such a big gun that yeah it has on paper it's, you should never lose a match <laughs> but if you can't shoot it well it it just defeats the purpose yeah and i think prs is moving more in the direction like, to an extent the upper level competitors are moving more in directions that a half moa gun is a requirement for the top 10% of the shooters top 5% in the circuit um but then it really still becomes can you read the wind but if you have a half minute gun and you can read the wind that's a one moa shot but you now are balancing your wobble zone so it now becomes our match director is going to put more one moa targets into the match to sort of defeat a good shooter art not artificially but to slim the margin that you have for a win call on one shot out of 10 and it, it's like i think we're getting really close to this sort of precipice for match design where instead of having you know an average of two moa targets you might move more towards 175 but you'll see a broader range of smaller targets force the the probabilities closer to your actual group size off of these positional style shoots and i don't know where that'll take us but it is going to push the sport to a new limit to how good because I mean, think about it we're when we're shooting off of a prop or a tire or a rock or a cattle gate and we're using tripod rear or we're using a bipod and kind of a weird awkward rock if our if our ability to have no wobble is consistent through an entire match it's just down to wind reading skills and your rifle's precision and your fundamentals right but assuming your fundamentals are right now it's wind and precision that makes it more like f class but if we start having more wobble and props how much of that are we allowed like how much of the wobble are we going to retain so that you have to fight through it versus target size or your wind call it becomes this weird multivariate equation that you end up having to figure out is this a hundred percent impact all the time or is this something that i will drop one if i were to fire this unless i get my my fundamentals even better off of that sort of wobbly prop or better at timing shots i don't know i'm not sure where the game's going to go but it's definitely moving closer to that sort of one and a half moa target size in almost all conditions so it's it's very very cool to see how good guys are getting with this sport so well you guys are really helping, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> you, you know, it's your fault. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's, I mean, we Damn talked it. about it in our very first episode. I mean, Chad, why don't you recap that? Because that was one of the very first things we said when we said, hey, we want to get better as we became friends. The first or second episode, um, we talk about why we're here. And that's exactly why we're here. Meaning miles to matches. Yeah, I mean, I feel like you and I started the discussions because we were already having them and we wanted to share our and have a little bit, you know, pull back the curtain, and have a little bit of insight into the type of stuff and the type of things that shooters that want to improve should be talking about. And we've been pretty upfront from the beginning. We don't have all the answers, but the discussion leads us down the road to either find the answers or gather the resources and and or the people that will help us find the answers and it's fun for us. And I, I still feel like we're going to revisit a lot of these topics over the next couple of years and have slightly different viewpoints on them because we have a different skill set. We have different experiences. We've met different people, the technology and, you know, everything in the industry is always evolving. And to me, that's interesting because if you think, you know, everything, then you will be left in the dust in a hurry because somebody else is going to figure something out. Nothing ever stays the same. And even for something, you know, like you guys shooting uh, F class, like you, you've distilled it down to a few variables, but I guarantee that there's still, that people are still figuring stuff out in that sport. I don't know what it is because I've never shot it and maybe I should come shoot a match with you one time, but, but I feel like uh, you're not just doing the same thing every time. It is absolutely evolving. There's always something new that's being discovered and uh the thing about f class is is when you find something and you kind of hang on to it and 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 try to go win with it right and then of course once you start winning people go what did you figure out what's going on here you know and and then of course you close circle you, you start sharing that with them right and oftentimes you share something that you found that you're trying to keep secret and they go i found out the same thing Mm -hmm. And then you guys start 
to talk about it and and oftentimes this big secret that you have that you're not sharing with anyone it turns out that a few people have known that for five years or or whatever you know and uh but it's it's very very it's a very it's a sport that you have to keep innovating or you're just never going to win you know what i'm saying yeah i almost wonder if it's kind of like I don't know, video gaming um, back in the day used to think of video games and there's this term called the meta of video gaming, which is the game within the game, right? So um, if there's like, for instance, in the game Modern Warfare, there's this, if everybody is using an SMG, which has a short range and it's very fast firing, but then you realize that if everybody's using that, you just need something that steps you back 20 feet so that they can't affect you as fast as you can affect them because they're less accurate or less precise. You've just worked the meta and you've essentially found the game to beat them. Well, then everybody will switch to, you know, sort of longer machine guns, if you will, or something that will outstep it again. And now the meta changes. And so there's this constantly evolving flow of what works to defeat the systems that are currently being used to win. And it feels a lot like that was the case in PRS. Like I've recognized those cycles with cartridges. People started with six fives, they moved to six millimeters. And now you see guys going back towards six fives simply because they can sheet the wind on some smaller targets and gain wind error because they're still shooting it as precisely as they are their six millimeters, except they're not seeing as much, but they don't need to, because if they're hitting more, they watching the impact is easier. If you're just seeing, you can watch your plate move. And so there's trade-offs that occur. It sounds like the same thing happens in F-Class. You know, people move to light, fast cartridges that are snappy. And then all of a sudden, well, if you get a windy match, you shoot a bigger caliber, faster cartridge, can't learn to handle the recoil. And then all of a sudden, oh, we should be moving that way because this guy's winning. And then the needle swings the other way, essentially. And there's a you touched on tail. You touched on shooters improving and skills and techniques and maybe a little bit of gear in the PRS causing these shifts in um, techniques. But I think match directors are also evolving and they're moving the targets, literally, physically, whatever, but they're also moving the course of fire and shaping it such that when they see certain trends in gear, equipment, or techniques, they're shifting those, uh, those stages to be something that is out of the ordinary or unexpected. And I I think we see a lot less gimmicky stages these days. I remember when we started, there'd be like boat simulators and all kinds of weird things. And we'd be shooting off at T posts. Like you got to throw your rifle on top of this T post. So no matter what you do, there's a wobble zone. That's like three, three MOA or whatever. Um, There's a lot less of that because targets are getting smaller. The course of fire is getting more complicated and mental. Um, There's just all these other variables. And as soon as you think you have something figured out, if you're not training to be just outside of the bounds of what you think you figured out right now, uh, then you are going to be surprised by something that is going to throw you off your game for sure. And, you you know, and it's going to happen at the most inopportune time. You know, it's going to be when you're up 10 points on the field going into day two, you're going to be surprised with something. Or when you show up to the AG Cup, there's going to be something that, you know, causes you to totally uh, be confused or, un, you know, take you, unsettle you off your normal, you know, position or your normal routine. So, I think that shooters are getting better, techniques are changing, but also match directors are evolving in the best possible way, in my opinion. And obviously we're just talking about PRS, but it's it's always it's always a excitement when you show up to a match and you just don't know what to expect. I still love going to matches that I've been to time and time again because I know that the match director is not gonna put on the exact same course of fire. I I went to uh to a PRS match. Uh, one of my machinists, the he wanted to try and i said let's go let's go shoot a prs match so we went this last saturday and it was a local match it's a it's a it's a club that they, they're kind of starting out trying to get people out there but anyway so we went and uh i the the match director asked me he said well what do you think i said man it was a great course of fire he said yeah i just want people to you know to enjoy it and I said, let me throw something at you. I'm not saying this is what you should do, but let me just throw something out there. I said, club matches should be for learning. Yep. I said, what if you do this? 
I said, you might want to run it with your guy, you know, with, with your, <laughs> with your customers. You know, I call them customers, you know, people that are attending the matches. I said, you know how you go to a club match? You guys probably remember this. You guys probably were always awesome, but you know, some of us, we don't start off that good. Um, you would go and shoot a match and then you'd make all these mental mistakes. And, you know, you go home and practice and, and try to work at it. But then you have no way to measure your, 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 your advancements because the next month you show up and the match is totally different. Mm -hmm. I said, what if you did this? I said, what if you ran the exact same course of fire two months in a row and then you change it? And that gives people a chance to go make mistakes, fix them, go home, fix them, work on it, come back the next month and have the exact same course of fire and see how much better they got. And once that happens, then you change it again. I just think that as a learning tool, that would be, that would be great. Yeah, yeah, or, every, or every year, maybe uh, five of the stages of the day were the same, like for that whole season, you know, mm -hmm. five or eight matches throughout the year. Every other stage was the exact same stage you shot last month. So you could go home, train it, set it up yourself. I mean, I agree. Every time I came home from a match that I failed on, um, which was every match at the beginning, but I would pick the two or three worst stages. And that's how I came up with the dry fire training group. I would recreate those stages in my barn as best as I could to the exact same scenario. And I would just dry fire it for hours until I could clean it every single time. And obviously you're dry firing. So you don't miss, right? Never miss. But uh, like just navigating the positions inside the time constraint was, I think that's people's biggest stressor at the very beginning but the time clock is your biggest enemy so i think I, I like what you said there i think that's a great idea whether you do it two weeks in a row or pick you know half a dozen stages that are always the same i don't think people would especially new people i don't think they would get frustrated or tired of that no yeah in, uh, in the 22 series that i run in michigan i've actually done almost ex that kind of a mix of what both of you are talking about so i'll run um two to three stages per match that I'm recycling from another. And I have historics for every single shooter and how every shooter on average performed on that plus individual shooters. And so as I add those sort of three stages back in, they keep getting cycled every other match. And I can watch scores from people who have shot those stages increase. And I can watch the average from the entire field increase or decrease just based on historics not changing anything about, about the prop uh, or the direction of fire. And I'll make notes like, hey, I widened the, you know, the fan, the cone of fire. So instead of doing a 10 degree separation between targets, I moved it to a 30 degrees target on a similar stage. And I'll watch the scores drop 10, 15% due to timing out. Um, but it's been interesting because as you watch the field over the course of about three years with uh, our club, the average score for like increasingly difficult matches has gone up about three to 4% over the course of not each match, but about two to 3% per match each season. Then I'll make them more difficult than the next match. And they go up, you know, two to 3% and it, it just keeps ratcheting up. So I'm trying to balance their progression upward with a similar hit rate. And it's scary how good some of these guys got very, very quickly, but also that the field is continuously rising up to the challenge and, and historic data is, is a really good thing to sort of challenge people's ability um, to recognize what they have to work on. So when they see a stage that they've shot in the past, they usually recognize it or I'll call it out before in our match brief. Like, look, guys, this is the stage you've shot before. There's a few like one change. Here's what it is. This is what you should be working on. And the entire match is actually prefaced beforehand to tell them this is the stressor. This is what you should be focusing on. Go do this and do it well. And then after the match, we break it all down and make sure everybody, you know, found what we were trying to stress them with and what we were trying to teach them. And I think they get a really, really big benefit out of that long term because they're consistently performing to the tasks that they're underperforming in. They're trying to find a way to get better at the things that are they're failing at or not shooting as well in. And we had several champions. So the first Mich the National Rimfire Champion came out of Michigan um, this year. Ron finished in the, I think, ninth or 10th position for the season. And Tim Novak, another senior in our club, finished fourth overall. Uh, we have a, a solid junior. Um, Lily Knapp did the same thing. 
it's it's really neat to see the progression of individual shooters when you give them the chance to actually refine their skills discreetly, not at just let's throw the kitchen, the bathtub and the sink out the window and start over again and give them a completely new set of challenges. It doesn't really help as much as it does by giving them stage progressive challenges. I agree. Francis for president. How about that? <laughs> yes. Worst, I got job. My head. Worst job ever. <laughs> oh man. I would never want that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. the, uh, it's it is uh, so we discussed this. I had Tim Vaught on my on my podcast, who is the current F class national champion, and you know I shoot at Bayou Rifle Club here in Houston, and that is one of the toughest clubs, bar none, for F class. I mean the the level of shooters there is is amazing. Like you know we're shooting at a one MOA target at a thousand yards, and last month tim vaught who is the current national champion he dropped three points this is at a thousand yards 60 shots only three times he missed the the six the the one moa target and i think he was third or fourth place <laughs> that's that's how tight the competition is i dropped i think i dropped six points for the day and i think i was eighth or ninth it's it's crazy right so the the point is we discussed this and when somebody new shows up they're gonna have two different mentalities they're gonna show up they're gonna get their ass kicked there's no question about it but they have two ways to look at it they can say i can't hang with these guys i'm done or they're gonna realize how lucky they are to be part of a club just full of freaking studs and people that they can learn from and realize that, hey, if I stick around, I'm going to become one of these guys or one of these shooters. Yep. And, you know, that's how they need to look at it. Club matches are learning experiences. They are not, I always tell people, you are not there to win. You're there to learn. And sometimes the wins are going to happen. You, you just can't avoid it, but you should be there to learn. I like how you said you can't avoid winning. You can't if if you're always doing <laughs> if you always do doing, doing the right thing. Yeah. You can't avoid it. Uh, Dude, I go probably... to our club matches every month, I, and it's hard to win club matches here in Michigan. I mean, we've got some incredible shooters, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, they know the range. Uh, we got this this couple Wally and Casey up there, and Francis and I did not take number one in Michigan this year. We did not take number two in Michigan this year. Uh, a couple, Wally and Casey, uh, Casey Kujowski, the top lady and top number one in Michigan, uh, took the whole series this year. It was pretty incredible. They both, yeah. they both beat us. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that's just how it works, right? If you work at it, if you do what you're supposed to do, uh, you know, Lanny Basham talks about just, just focus on the process. Don't, don't try to win. Just focus mm -hmm. on the process and the winning is just going to happen. You, you literally cannot avoid it. And that's a fact. I mean, that's pretty much my mindset. I mean, we've talked about Lanny and you've had him on your show and I, I that's whenever I w have won a match, it's because I, I know it's possible, but I don't even think about it. Like I'm not thinking about the outcome. I'm thinking about the process of steps. And I can tell when I'm driving to a match and Francis has asked me before, he's like, how do you feel? I'm like, I feel just right. Like I feel confident, yeah. but I feel like this uh, is possible, but not probable unless I do everything I need to do and not think about the outcome. Uh, there's a lot of people that can take home the win and, and I'm one of them, but I just need to not think about the end result. I only need to think about the process steps. That kind of keeps me grounded and calm because any given Sunday, there's you show up to a match these days, a pro match, there's, you know, 15, 20 guys that take it. It's crazy. Yeah. And they're all selfish. They all want it for themselves. Yeah. But it starts, like you said, it starts with the mindset of this, the fight or flight reaction that occurs when you see everybody around you and you're thinking, I can't be that good. Like, I, I can't do that. As soon as that occurs, you've already lost that fight. And, and candidly, it's really hard to get back onto that horse. If you've ever said, I can't 
be that good because of how good someone is. Like if you're playing basketball and you go up against LeBron James or, you know, Jordan in his heyday or anything, and you're just starting. Yeah. You're going to lose. Like there is no way about it. But if you then just said, I will be that good someday. And you don't put a time limit on it. You just know that every day you're going to work closer and closer and closer to that goal. It can happen. I mean, one day it's unavoidable. Like, like, yeah, said. yeah, it'll, yeah. You can't avoid it. You can't avoid winning. Mm-hmm. You just, you just, you I just love this. Can't. That's how we should end it. <laughs> you just, <laughs> so, um, that, that is, that is a good high note that we should probably end it on, but it, cause it I, is, no, you don't have to end it. I'm just saying you could call the whole episode. Like you can't avoid winning. You can't yeah, avoid, yeah, we'll call it that. But <laughs> I mean, it is, it is. So I, 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 uh, I had a, a major league baseball player on my podcast last night. He's a, he's a pitcher and we discussed the mindset. Right. And he said he, he, uh, he was having a hard time making the, make it into the major leagues because he was just trying so hard. And he said one day, he just said, you know what, enough of this. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen. If it doesn't, it's not going to happen. I'm just going to play and have fun. Guess what? Major leagues, you know? Yeah. It's, yep. it's, uh, it's crazy how we can keep ourselves from winning because we focused on, I don't know, you focus on the scores. You focus on, on a bad match. I mean, I was listening to your, your, uh, your uh, episode on, uh, you know, the uh, AG Cup, how, you know, you dropped two, two five-point matches and you had 110. And it's like, yeah. in reality, there's no difference, right? But exactly. on the I surface... Zero. No, I had a, well, I had a zero and he okay. dropped two fives. It was the same thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, but on the surface, it looks bad. Like, it, you know, like yours look yours looks worse than his, but it's not. It's there's the same thing, and and it and it shouldn't even matter, right? Like like you said, you yep. know, uh, oftentimes people tank the first stage of the of the competition, and they go like, "Oh, I'm out." No, you're gonna <laughs> yeah. tank one at some point, and it just doesn't matter where it falls. You just gotta dust yourself off and keep on trucking, keep on pushing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the the hardest part about the mentality of if something occurs that's negative. I'm, I'm, that's my end point. That's my stopping point is exactly that. There's a point at which, you know, if you recognize it's unavoidable and you're going to have a small failure, it might be a millimeter, it might be a mile, but as soon as you can get past it, the faster you can get past it uh, and take the positive out of it. Like when I missed on the, the one MOA circles, it was foggy and rolling in. I'm like, I didn't see anything. Like, I don't know what I missed on that. I just know I missed. I hit every other shot. Okay. So I, I learned that when I can't see targets, it's harder to correct. Shoot slower. <laughs> like, I mean, maybe the wind, maybe the fog will roll out and I'll be able to see something for one more shot. Then on yeah. the tripod stage, like, hey, I didn't, I didn't take the time to settle the tripod. Well, take the time to settle the tripod because two in, like in that specific match, three shots and I tie uh, for the win on that one for the day two. It was three points behind the leader or something like that on Austin Bushman. Like that's, Oh, it's so easy to have your mindset overcome the possibility of success that it's all of a sudden, no, there's no way you can win. It's not unavoidable. Now you have just made it impossible to win. Speedy, yeah. speedy, something he told me one day and it has just stuck around. Like he, he told me one day, don't get in a hurry to lose points. Yeah. And it's such a simple sentence that just goes, wow. And that's what you did. You got in a hurry to lose points. Mm-hmm. Just slow it down and profit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Or, or not. <laughs> yeah. In my case, I had nine seconds on one stage to, to just hit one shot. And had I hit that shot, yeah, it's it's a $1,000 check plus a two $3,000 air gun. It's $4,000. And I didn't profit. Let's just say it that way. <laughs> Jeff Geary got me. Well, <laughs> he profited. He did. Off profit, of your yeah. shot. He did. Yeah. So, so that's, the, that's still, the, He's the, listening. I, you still owe me, Jeff. I still have that other scope that it's ready for you. Just swap. You should have. You should have. You should have shot better, Francis. You need to let that one go. Yeah. There you go. 
Yeah, shoot better yeah. next time. Or yeah, or exactly. or what's the what's the flip side? Suck less. Suck less. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, don't don't suck. suck. Yeah, don't no, suck. We don't like that one. We don't like that one. It's not. It's a little too negative. No, I like to stay with the positive. Yeah, I like to stay with the positive. All right, shoot better. Yeah. So so uh, one thing that uh, um, F class guys have started doing is they're kind of taking this, you know, we're talking about guns and, and cartridges, almost like a golf approach where mm-hmm. they'll bring two or th- three different rifles. They'll bring like a 284 or a, or a light recoiling seven millimeter. So if the mint, why, if the wind is mild, they'll shoot the, the, the one that they can shoot fast and accurate. And if the wind picks up, they go and pull out their big boomer and then they shoot that. Um, what are the rules in PRS? Can you, can you switch guns? Willy nilly. No, I want to ask. Willy-nilly. I want to ask first. Like, does that work for people? Yeah. Well, the national champion did, did it. it. Okay, so I just wondered because I know people that do that in the PRS. They'll they'll check the weather before they leave. And this specifically, this discussion came up last year at Raton, yeah. which was the PRS finale last year. It was at like it wasn't at the Whittington Center, but it was like Cole Canyon, which is just on the back side of the property. And so that place is notorious for having some weird, you know, intense winds. Right. Um, and there's people messaging me the week before they're like, I see the wind's going to be up to 25 mile an hour. What do you think about being bringing my six, five Creed with some heavy bullets or my 25 Cal, um, whatever, 25 Creed. And I'm like, Hmm, I, I, you can do what you want, but I am used to what my one Oh five hybrids do in all conditions. And I'm used to the recoil impulse. I'm used to, I can make quick corrections. I know how to see the bullet. I am not changing the dang thing. You know, like I know people that have tried that and it has never worked out for any of them. So I was, that's what I was asking. Has it worked out for you guys? It sounds like it has, but yeah. I think people have tried to game that in the PRS and it's bit more people than it's, you know, helped. Yeah. I think the reason that hasn't worked well in PRS is because of the dynamic nature of our sport, right? Where between see, seeing your shot on target is not really a given because we don't have the paster and the target coming back up or the digital scoreboard. You can shoot, let's call it slow prone where it's constantly, I say slow. I know it, it, you can have to shoot really fast at sometimes in F class, but in PRS, if you happen to miss a shot because you had poor fundamentals on recoil control, you have no idea where to go next. And that can be a, like a cascade failure down that stage to where, yeah, you drop six, seven, eight points. That leads to mental lapses. Is my gun not shooting? Am I not shooting well? What's going on? Lack of confidence. Then you get an eight. Then you get a bunch of sixes. Then you get a nine. Then you get a bunch more sixes. If you, if you just stick with the same thing, though, you have a far better chance. Or you practice like crazy with it. Um, if I were going to do that, I would always be shooting a 6.5 Creed during practice. And then occasionally it would switch back to a dasher just to get through it. But it's, it's really hard to do. Uh, they don't track the same when you go really heavy cartridge, like relatively speaking, you know, a heavy six, five or a fast six, five versus a, you know, light recoiling slow six, they don't react the same on the gun. Yeah. I started with a six, five and then I went to a six and I'm like, Oh my God, this is so much easier. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. This is, it is so much easier to dump rounds into the barn with a six at least for me <laughs> i can see them a lot better <laughs> yeah can... <laughs> yeah That's is anybody case. in in f class or in, in the matches you shoot are they is anybody shooting six fives or is everybody shooting seven and above yeah they're pretty much seven there's there's no believe it or not there's hardly any room for six fives either they're shooting sixes or sevens and above like the the they call the six fives an in betweener because if it's mild enough for a six five, they will just shoot a six, right? Like a dasher or or a BRA or nobody's something. shooting the twenty five. The what? The twenty five? Any of the twenty fives out there? Nope. No. It's it's just it's just not worth it ballistically, right? Because <laughs> if you require a twenty five for 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 its ballistics and you're shooting these uh, super high BC bullets, well then just shoot a seven, <laughs> you know. And I think something similar happened in PRS. The tw- the quarter bore seemed to take this like, quick spin of popularity. Chad built one. He's like, let's see if this works. And man, I shot his and he, I don't know. He, I'll let him speak to it, but I was kind of impressed at how it ended up feeling like the worst of both worlds. I couldn't see anything. I, 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 world, I think it's, I think it's better than the six, five. 
Um, but it's just so close to the six, five that I, I only shoot it for training and I, I haven't brought myself to shoot it in a match yet. I built it because I wanted to try to game that a little bit and it just, it just didn't work out. So now it's my, my trainer. Yeah. That's kind of the thing about F class. It's, it's, uh, you know, if you're going to shoot a six, five, because you know, it's like l less recoil. Well, you, we're shooting 22 pound rifles that, that, that seven millimeters are not bad. You know, they're, they don't, they're very light recalling in a sense of uh, you can you can shoot them. It's almost like singing and playing the guitar. You don't think about it. You just shoot, yeah. push it forward. It's right back to the target. Go to town. Uh, if it's a very mild condition and it's 600 yards, they'll shoot. Some guys will pull out their dashers and their BRAs or whatever, and they'll just, you know, they shoot them really fast and they just clean house and get out of there but uh for the last oh i'm gonna say five six years there may have been one dash for the one but everything else has been 300 wsms and seven millimeters winning mid-range matches now 600 yards wild because they are these sevens are shooting so good that i mean they're shooting with the dashers uh, but you know ballistically they're far superior so yeah, yeah. It, you know these sevens they just shoot so good i mean so i have a i have a question for you on like call it the meta i just i just thought of this again with the change in e targets and like digital scoring which i think is that predominant now for no, f -class? not yet no? not yet okay yeah i know up here it is when you shoot do you guys see is there a difference in how you shoot or how you score i, I think you maybe understand what i'm asking was there a difference in if I'm shooting a paper target? Is there a different strategy than shooting an e target? It is different or in a sense of, um, for example, when it's really windy and you're shooting paper mm -hmm. targets, you start scanning your neighbors to see how they're doing, who's shooting, who's not shooting. Oh, I think the wind picked up so and so is over there. Let me see how he's doing. And they'll shoot and they'll shoot down wind, and you're like, okay, I knew it. You know, I'm, I'm going to wait with e-targets. It's a lot harder to do that because you don't have that. You have yeah. to literally get on the tablet and try to see who's shooting, you know? Uh, so that's one thing where it's different. Uh, other than that, it's very similar because mm -hmm. they, in, in the e-targets, they actually put a delay eight seconds to mimic a target being pulled. Cause what happened is when they first started using e-targets, they had no delay. So guys would bench rest their way through, you know, just shoot so fast. And, uh, and, uh, that's how they would do it. And then, and then they put the delay, but they didn't <laughs> guys, you know, it's, it's like, uh, what, what it, what it, uh, Ryan, uh, what's his name? Ryan. Uh, I just had him on the podcast. God dang Blackner. it. Kleckner. Yeah, Kleckner. Yeah. He said, if you're not, what do you say? If you're not, if you're not cheating, you're not, you're not trying. What do you say? If you're not trying to win, you're, you're not, not gaming. Yeah. If you're not cheating, you're not trying to win. And if you get caught, you're not trying hard enough. <laughs> 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 uh, but anyway, uh, he, 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 he was talking about the military, how, how, you know, going through sniper's course. Oh, yeah. But anyway, um, uh, he the guys would you know the shooters then they said okay we're going to do an eight second delay right so to avoid that right well then they figured out real quick that yeah there's a delay but if you shoot it'll still it'll still it'll log the it'll, shot it'll right? still log the shot <laughs> so they would still just shoot real fast right and and the target would fall behind but you know if you know if they were shooting if it was an x they would just shoot really fast and they just shoot, shoot, shoot. And then, uh, they'll see a 10 or whatever. They'll, they'll wait, see where it hit it. And then they'll, they'll, so now they, they made it to where if it's during the delay, it will not log a shot. So if you shoot, you just, you just lost 10 points, you know, but it's, uh, it's interesting how E targets are, or I, I love E targets. I love the fact that you can, you can shoot. You can go, you know, you can, when you're not shooting, you're hanging out with your friends, just. Instead of having to go work. So does, 
for half. So the does day. the e target have a ba- a paper backup like contingency? No, that's the problem. That mm-hmm. there's that's why they're um, e targets are not used for national championships or any of that. It's for yeah. that purpose. I can see that because man, I would want to see my paper after I shot it. Like if I was if there was anything in question, I mean, it would be nice to have a physical copy of it. You know. Yeah, I mean that's that's the difference with uh, e targets. They're they're still not super. I mean they're great for club matches. They're they're great, but for you know national championships, we don't use uh, e targets. Now we the put on a match. Lie. We put on a match called uh, V squared. Um, it's a finale kind of. We take the top thirty two shooters and and uh, F Open and the top thirty two in FTR. And we invite them kind of like a PRS type of thing, right? And they get invited and uh, we shoot, uh, we shoot on E-targets, but we pair fire. So they both get on the same target. So if you have a faulty target, they both have a faulty target, right? But this is not an aggregate score. You're only shooting against that person. And once you beat them, then you move on and it's a double elimination type of thing. So they get, elim- you know, they get, one loss and then two losses are out. But that was the, the way that the E target doesn't really affect anything because if you get a bad target, they both have the same target, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's a very fun match because you know immediately who won and who lost. Just it's, and it's over. Yeah. Like, the, it, it, you know, it's best two out of three. And if they're still tied, you just keep shooting until somebody has a lower shot on paper or on target. <laughs> so there was a concept, I forget who I was talking to. One of the guys, it might've been Streeter or one of the other guys, um, manufacturers or one of the other shooters. Like what if we did a PRS match or like just a short one, five or six stages where everybody shot head to head on the same course of fire, same props. If you duplicate everything and you have it's unlimited rounds on a stage, and you simply have to hit and whoever the last target is just like the poppers in uh what is it three gun where it's like whoever hits it it falls on top or falls on bottom and that's the decider so yeah it's unlimited your goal is just to hammer down and you're trying to get through these targets but they're small enough that yeah you do it too fast and you're just wasting time and seeing if you could turn prs a style of prs shooting into similar to three gun for a stage or two just to see what it would be like. Cause it's almost like a dueling tree type of thing. Yeah. But at different distances yeah, yeah. and you run through a regular stage, I, I think it would be kind of interesting to see what a 400 yard or 600 yard, you know, popper, one of you has got to smack it, but you just, you had to hit eight other targets to get to that point at different distances off of five different props. Just like the, <laughs> I, I watched a really cool video of what is it? Somebody said, how did, this is how you win a national championship. And it was, the last shoot off for like, a, I think it was one of the pistol sports. I'm not familiar with them, but they started out at the same little box. They were 10 feet apart go. And it was like five props with all their guns and pistols shooting all these steals. And then the last one, they race to the middle and one dude hits it. He's there like three seconds before the other guy gets there and he's the national champion. I'm like, you know how cool that would be to win a national championship head to head. It's like, that's the target that matters. Right. Just yeah, I can tell you really. Done. I can tell you like the idea. It's <laughs> just by your body language. Like so much fun. His arms are flailing. Yeah. And- <laughs> it's happening. It's happening. That's what it would feel like in the stage too. I'd just be going everywhere. But this is like him talking on the podcast while he's driving. No hands on the wheel. He's just <laughs> like this all over the place, whacking the microphone. <laughs> It's not wrong. Uh, that's, that's that's fun stuff. Well, yeah, I mean, there's so much that can be done to improve attendance and fun factor. Fun factor for sure. It's uh, you know, I know we all enjoy what we do, but uh, you know, there's tons of people out there going. These guys are idiots. They, they really enjoy doing that. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, you know, just yeah. different strokes for different folks. But we yep. love it. I love it, man. I love I love what I do. Uh, I know you guys do as well. And I love sharing what, what I know and seeing others have success with whatever knowledge I was able to share with them. That is, to yep. me, that is, that is amazing. Mm-hmm. It's, 
it's a passion. That's why we shoot, you know, miles to matches and, and what we've done with the podcast. It's been pretty dang incredible. Uh, Dude, the response is amazing. Like there's people that have hit the yeah. podium and they, all they've done is work on their own dry fire train, but they attribute their inspiration to listening to and exercising the, the different topics that we talk about. And that is, uh, that's pretty awesome, man. That, it, it hits me pretty hard sometimes. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, that's, I know you're, you're getting the same effect though, Eric. Yeah. Yeah. It, I love 100%. it. I mean, I love it. It's, it's, uh, you know, like I said, Tim, Tim bought, uh, he, he's my, he was my little, my grasshopper at some point. You know, he, he and, and, you know, I don't I don't like to say that because uh, I don't want to diminish his accomplishments. But, you know, at one point in time, he used yeah, he to call me. It. He used to call me quite often and ask me about everything. And I spent over an hour with him on the phone, just just talking and answering his questions. But it was the fact that he had those questions and I the questions that he had, I knew he was really going to be something. And he is he's a national champion. Uh, but, uh, you know, that is, uh, to me, that's somewhat an, of an accomplishment of mine to have shared some of my knowledge with somebody that put it to work, you know, and, and, and then went and, you know, won a national championship. It's yep. just, Made it's it awesome. Down. Yeah. It's awesome. Good stuff. Well, guys, this has been amazing. Thank you so much. Fun. Uh, we need to do this more often, honestly, because yeah, man, this is the first time. Whenever, this is man. the first time we've got together, all three of us, uh, at least on my on my channel. I know we did it on your podcast, discussing. I don't even know what we're talking about, flyers or or just that yeah. whole flyer thing. It's just cleaning, cleaning, <laughs> cleaning, and flyers, and then yeah, you mentioned something about I don't know bullet pointing. We should talk about sometimes. So maybe oh maybe we'll yes, we need to do that. We need to talk about bullet pointing at some point. Maybe maybe we do that. Maybe we do that when I come down there. Yeah, when you come down here, we're gonna do it here in the studio, and and uh, we, we can actually we can have if if Francis we can and invite like, him over. He wants me to buy a die and start pointing these things, and I'm like, oh man, I just want to shoot him. I don't want to do any work to him. Yeah, well, I'm gonna. I, I do all this testing and I put it on my website on the members uh, side, you know, because uh, people that are members of my website, they, they have all this info already where, you know, we've done testing and show them targets and, you know, the difference. But I need to I need to go back through all those and start putting some of those out here mm -hmm. to the for the public to see, because it is quite. Make it can make quite a bit dif quite a big difference. Uh, and, you know, we talked about the bench rest shooters, how f over in a week, over a week, second place loses by two ten thousandths of an inch. Yeah. You guys, if you know, sometimes if you could gain one shot over two or three days and that's, that's where you guys are at. You guys are fighting for one shot. Yeah. Well, Jim, yeah. I mean, we said it earlier, but one shots, not just for the match. It's the whole damn season. season. That one shot yeah. at that one match could have gotten you third place. But that one point at that match, taking it to the finale, could have gotten you a top ten bullet. Yeah, yeah, and this, and it's he said it really well in the last when we talked about this in the episode. You know, the reason pointing for him works is he's touching his each projectile multiple times. So if there's a defect, if there's something different, he's seeing it. And even if it's only one in two thousand projectiles, one you know that's really truly going to cause a problem catching that one in 2000 might be that one round that was going to go to a point that you needed. So I'll grant you, there's some matches. I, there's some one or two bullets I want back. I might consider it. <laughs> so, so before, you know, before we, we, uh, we sign off, um, I, I probably have told this story, but I'm going to tell it again. 2016, the record was 200 with 17 X's. Mm -hmm. Okay. I shoot a 200 with 16 and two shots were as close as you can get to the X ring without actually being an X. I mean, they are just right there. Had I been shooting at 30 caliber, it would have been a national but record because that that's bigger. It, w it would have cut the line, but it didn't. But guess what? To this day, to this day, 
I, I'm I'm perfectly okay with that score because guess what? I did everything I could. My brass was turned. My bullets were pointed. Uh, ev- my powder was weighed to the kernel. It just wasn't meant to be, right? Yep, exactly. And right. it was it was before I was doing all that. Something like that would happen to me, and I'd be driving home just kicking myself, going, "If I, you know, it's my fault. I should have done this. I should have done that." And it may it may not have made any difference whatsoever but it's just that just that idea that i could it, it, that it was my fault that i yeah. that i could have had it but i didn't simply because i didn't want to do that extra step now I as mean, you know you said driving home i was gonna say you've said driving home you've had these thoughts or you've thought about having these thoughts of those one shot uh the interesting thing now is since we record to and from matches for the miles to matches podcast we do have those feelings on the way home from matches now and we've captured that a few times and it's a pretty interesting dynamic i think i've said before like i'm i'm not surprised if people can tell which episodes we record to the matches than <laughs> some of them that are recorded from yeah. the matches like They're some of them obvious. start with like a you know when we win and then other ones are like very like just okay, you can tell we're drained and there's just a learning point that we need to hit home. I mean, we still have the conversations because we would be having them anyway and they're necessary conversations for the personal growth that needs to happen to learn from those things. Um, but those now are captured <laughs> and they're out there for eternity for, you know, as, unless we delete them, but we're not going to. No. There's some, there's some good ones out there, some good learning points on the way back from matches. Yeah, for sure. It's it's and you know, this is why I started doing this podcast as well. I, I just wanted to the main reason I wanted to do it is like, I, you know, I need to get out of my own bubble and, and talk to others and see what they have to, you know, I might learn something from you or from that guy, or from, you know, and I have, I definitely have. And it just keeps on going and I'm loving it. I'm loving every step of the way. And I know that people are, that are watching are also learning because of the comments they go this is this is just the just so amazing like they just don't know what they're going to pick up from somebody right yeah. and you know it's like like uh like ryan when when he and i were on he he was saying that one and more gun is he thinks that one and more gun is all you ever need and and he's like i know we're going to disagree on that i'm like no i don't disagree because the f-class target is one and more yeah. if i could if I, if I was a one and one shooter all the time, I would be national champion, world champion. I'd be like every kind of champion, but we don't always shoot one and one, right? That's literally the, the, the bar that we have to, to meet. And it's very hard to be a one and one shooter a hundred percent of the time. So that yep. was something that we had in common that he didn't even think like, you know, I'm like F-class shooter. There's no way he's going to agree with me. Well, then when people hear that, they go, huh? You know, it, it may reset their, their, uh, their expectations a little, yep. but you know, it's just very, very interesting. All right, guys. Well, Merry Christmas, happy new year. And, uh, Chad, you're coming over next year. Yeah. About a month. Yeah. I'm glad. I am so glad I kept asking questions. When- yeah. Cause you're like, Hey, I'm going on a family vacation. No, we're talking January, buddy. Yeah, not he December. Said, <laughs> yeah, I thought he was going to be here in a few days, and I'm like, let me, you know what? And I was still going, let me talk to my wife. I, I might still could make this happen. <laughs> I can't believe you said that. <laughs> and then, I, and then, and then uh, you said something else, and I'm like, wait a minute, is this next month? You're like, yeah. And I'm like, oh, yeah, then I can definitely make it. Like, no problem. <laughs> I can't believe you thought I was not even booking travel yet, and it was like a few days from now. <laughs> Hey man, you know, I don't judge. The match has already started. <laughs> the match already started, you know, yeah. for sure. All right, guys. Yeah. It was it was amazing. Thank right. you so much. And uh yeah. I will see you guys next year. We need to do this more often. Well, I agreed. Merry Christmas. Have a good night, man. Good I'll talk year. to you in the morning, Francis. All right. Merry Christmas. I'll, I'll see you in the morning, buddy. <laughs> All right, bye. Bye bye.